Okay, well, officially, uh, we are going to uh, uh, reconvene and get uh, started on the last panel, which I think we styled the view from the FTC, uh, but there's a lot that be can be covered uh, under that topic. So once again, uh, welcome for those that may just be joining us uh, at this point. And uh, again, I want to welcome our uh, C-SPAN audience uh, as well and uh, thank C-SPAN again for uh, being here to cover this important conference. Now, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, just before turning it over to our moderator, that Christine Wilson uh, uh, is obviously not here in her chair. Uh, she's here with us. Uh, hi, Christine. Uh, she's here by Zoom. Uh, she, uh, she couldn't join us because of COVID-related reasons, but we're uh, delighted. Uh, that she'll be here over Zoom and can participate. So I want to uh, turn it over to Maureen Ohausen, as I have uh, done uh, with every other session. Maureen, I'm, I'm not going to read your whole bio here. Uh, I'm going to refer again to the, the program. Uh, you're welcome to do whatever you wish with the, the other two commissioners, but, but I do want to say that uh, number one, uh, I'm delighted that Maureen is, is with us again because, and I say again because uh, we've been uh, grateful you've participated in past Free State Foundation events, and uh, you did that when you were uh, a commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission, uh, as well as acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, so it's hard to think of anyone that's more qualified to uh, to uh, moderate this last session than you are. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maureen Ohausen. Great. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Randy. I'm delighted to be here and particularly honored to be interviewing uh, two FTC commissioners, uh, Commissioner Noah Phillips, who's here uh, with me, and Commissioner Christine Wilson, who is joining us through the magic of Zoom. Uh, their bios are in uh, the materials, um, and I won't spend a lot of time belaboring that because we have so many interesting topics to talk about in a short, in a short amount of time. So there's one thing, uh, you know, what I'll say is our, my first question, uh, among others, is that FTC and DOJ have asked for comments on revising the horizontal and vertical merger guidelines and uh, the RFI, as it's known, uh, and the comments were filed uh, recently in, uh, in April. And the Free State Foundation submitted comments that described some recent mergers in the telecom space and questioned whether the RFI's skepticism of mergers and efficiencies are justified. Uh, so I might start off with Commissioner Wilson and ask what your thoughts are on what changes may be in the works and whether any changes are necessary. Thank you so much, Maureen and Randy, for inviting me to join you today. And my apologies that I can't be there in person. It's always fun to appear with Noah. So obviously, I'm speaking only for myself and not for any other commissioner, although I will probably agree with 99% of, of everything that Noah says. Um, <laughs> with respect to your question, Maureen, um, to, to take a step back, Commissioner Phillips and I supported the issuance of the RFI, the request for information with respect to the merger guidelines. And as we expressed in a statement that we issued when the RFI itself was issued, the FTC has a long history of self-examination. DNA is built on conducting hearings and workshops and roundtables and collecting input from stakeholders. And so we agree that it is a good thing to revisit the merger guidelines every so often to ensure that the guidelines still reflect sound legal precedent and sound economic analysis and dynamic technology markets and other emerging forms of competition in industry. And so we welcome the issuance of the RFI 
with respect to the changes that will ensue, I think um, the, the jury is out on that. We've had something like 1,900 comments that have been submitted so far. We have had some listening sessions hosted by FTC and DOJ. And so we are still, in some ways, collecting input from stakeholders. With respect to the changes that we might see, I can hazard a guess. If you take a look at the RFI, it appears that there are some assumptions baked into the questions. And I believe that, uh, that those assumptions are problematic. And so I would very much appreciate the submission of comments on a couple of topics that I'm gonna mention now, but other topics that Commissioner Phillips and I mentioned in our, uh, in our statement that was issued when the RFI was issued. So for example, uh, the, the, the RFI seeks examples of mergers that have harmed competition, including how those mergers made it more difficult for rivals to compete with the merged firm. Now this question clearly is equating harm to rivals with harm to competition, but we have decades of precedent indicating that uh, that in fact, the purpose of the antitrust laws in the United States is to protect competition, not competitors. And so that assumption that appears to undergird a set of questions is, uh, is worthy of discussion in the comments. And then second, there appears to be an assumption with respect to the efficiencies questions that mergers typically generally do not generate cognizable efficiencies. And I would say this is a worthy area of inquiry. We want to be sure that we are tailoring our analysis to reality. And so it is good and right to collect information on whether and to what extent mergers create efficiencies. But I think a going in assumption that they typically don't generate efficiencies is contrary to empirical evidence uh, that, that we're aware of. And so I look forward to reviewing the public comments that are submitted. And I do hope that I can have a very collegial and open and collaborative discussion with my colleagues on the commission and at the antitrust division uh, to, to ensure that uh, we reach a sound and sustainable version of the merger guidelines that reflects sound legal precedent and sound economic analysis. That's the only way that the merger guidelines that are created will actually be durable and useful to courts, parties, and the agencies. Th thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Wilson. Um, there's you know, enormous interest in th what the merger guidelines will look like because they apply across the board to every, to every industry. But Commissioner Phillips, I wanted to ask you a question. The Free State Foundation comments also highlighted the issue of killer acquisitions. Um, and do you think that the agencies need to apply greater scrutiny to small acquisitions, especially in digital markets? Thanks, Maureen, for the question and also for being here. It's a delight to be here with you uh, and virtually with Christine. Um, it's a great privilege of my life to have had the opportunity to work with both of you. Um, and thanks, Randy, to the Free State Foundation for today and for having me here. Um, I want to echo the qualifier that Commissioner Wilson gave, which is what I'm going to say is just my view um, and not necessarily the view of other commissioners or the commission, although, as she aptly noted, the two of us do tend to agree a lot. Um, but I think it's fairly obvious that not all of us agree on everything, so maybe the qualifier can be shortened in the future. So killer acquisitions is like great branding. And it comes from this really important article that uh, Cunningham and Ma and Ederer wrote about acquisitions not in the tech space, but the pharmaceutical space. And what they noted was that if you look at the development of drugs over time, um, drugs that seem to have been potential competitors, uh, where the deal to acquire them was below the Hart Scott Rodino level, so the acquisition wasn't getting noticed to the agencies, they were seeming not to develop um, at a much higher rate. And so there is this suggestion in the paper that there are times when one company will acquire another that has a product in development that might compete, um, and then they're canceling that development. Now, there are a lot of reasons that drug development ends, uh, but the statistics are something, and the article is worth reading. But I think the place I would start is it's not just about big tech. 
or technology, right? That's an article. The article that coined the phrase killer acquisitions is about um, the pharmaceutical space and drug development and drug manufacture. And do we need to be looking at acquisitions of small nascent competitors? Absolutely. Have we, be, have we been doing that? I think the answer is clearly yes. You know, whether you look at DOJ in the Visa Plaid case or you look at the FTC over the last few years, this is Illumina Pacbile, this is Harry's and Edgewell, this is P&G Billy. Uh, in case after case after case, we are concerned about this dynamic. We understand that sometimes the competition is going to come not from another company that looks exactly like the incumbent or like the acquirer, um, but rather from a smaller nascent competitor. We've been doing these cases. Um, they have not gone to litigation, so we don't have decisions recently that are reading on this specific issue, but I do think there is enough agency experience for us to take that um, and reflect it in the guidelines. And, I can't remember where I heard it first, but I definitely agree with the sentiment. The best guidelines are those that are descriptive, not prescriptive. They're explaining to parties, to the public, to staff at the agencies what it is we are doing, and we have a track record of attention to this kind of competitive dynamic and what effect mergers may have. Um, and I think it's fair to look at that experience um, and reflect it in greater depth uh, in an updated guideline. Great. Well, thank you. I also might add CDK Automate to that, yes, to that list. Yes, yes. That was brought when I was the acting chair. So, <laughs> so obviously lots of interesting things going on at the FTC, and we'll come, we'll come back to those. But right now I wanted to turn uh, to some of the activity in Congress. So Congress is considering bills to impose new obligations on a small, easily identifiable <laughs> group of digital platforms to impose open access and non-discrimination obligations. And then these are paired with large penalties for violations. And the ABA antitrust section just issued comments raising serious concerns about the bills and cautioning against departing from the antitrust law's commitment to protecting the competitive process overall rather than protecting a certain set of competitors against others. So Commissioner Phillips, do you, do you think these bills suggest a move away from the consumer welfare focus of antitrust towards more of a fairness approach? And if so, what are the risks and benefits of that change? Sure. I sort of look at two models when we think about how to deal with problems in competition from a legislative perspective. So one, I think, broadly speaking, is a model where we have rules intended to either stoke, uh, you know, allow for competition to happen, like the Sherman Act and the FTC Act, the Clayton Act, or bills that help enforcers, right, like the Hart-Scott-Rodino Act. Um, and those are rules of essentially general application. And we also have examples in history of rules of more specific application. And one word that I think is fair to apply to these is regulation, right? We look at a particular market um, or a particular kind of conduct uh, and we say, hey, uh, left to its own devices, the market isn't going to fix this, and so we need a rule. Um, we need a law that will help accomplish this. What's interesting about the proposals that you're discussing and some of the other ones that concern some of the you know, app stores or mergers is they take a very different tack. What they say is there is a kind of conduct, and we don't want to condemn it in general in the economy. We want to condemn it when certain companies do it. And what distinguishes these companies isn't like they're in a particular industry or a kind of business conduct, but <coughs> that they have a, an amount of users, right, and a certain market capitalization. And I think it's fairly clear, both because of the rhetoric, right, and how the bills are drafted, that they're aimed at a certain set of companies. And I guess I would start from the premise that whatever is being done here isn't really about the competitive process or competition. Forget consumer welfare or fairness. <laughs> um, it's not really about competition. It's about identifying a set of firms and saying, here are some things that you can't do. You can't merge. Or you, know, you can't self-preference where everybody else in the market is allowed to self-preference. You know, that is an approach to policy. Um, I don't think it puts the consumer first. Uh, it seems to put the firm first, right? We start with the definition. And then what's interesting, too, when you look at the set of firms, um, and this has always struck me in a lot of our political debate when we talk about big tech, 
but usually we have four or five companies in mind. And I think it's fair to say that these four or five companies um, have certain similarities, but for the most part, they're different businesses. Apple's business is just very different from Facebook's. Amazon's business is very different from Google. They both have you know, cloud services, but for the most part, we are talking about establishing a similarity um, of these companies for purposes of legislation that is based on like very vague words like gatekeeper. Um, and really the business practices are very different. And I think that's why you get some very awkward conversations around these bills. Things like they're, they're all monopolists in the same market and somehow you have monopoly market with five players in it. So <laughs> Lots of things. For example, for example. Um, so Commissioner Wilson, sticking with congressional action, you, so you have long advocated for a federal privacy law. Do you think that's within reach, finally? Uh, and if not, what actions might the current FTC undertake to fill the gap? You are correct, Maureen, that I have been advocating for federal privacy legislation almost uh, from, from the day that I was sworn in as a commissioner. And I do think it's important. I think there is a market failure that needs to be addressed. I think consumers have very little understanding of the data that's collected from them and how that data is collected, used, and sold. I also think that businesses need guardrails. They need to understand the rules of the road. And right now we have states with conflicting opinions about what those guardrails should be. And we have a developing international regime also with conflicting ideas. And so businesses need clarity and certainty in order to, uh, to know how to comply with the law, but also to, to invest and to grow. And, uh, and so I do believe it's necessary to have federal privacy legislation. And I tend to be a Pollyanna, but I'm actually hopeful, more hopeful than I have been, because I hear there's a concerted push to get federal privacy legislation across the finish line soon. And that, that would be wonderful. I do believe that, uh, especially in the current environment, it's important for Congress to make the judgments, the value judgments inherent in uh, privacy and data security and how those tensions uh, between privacy and competition get balanced. That said, there is a lot that the FTC can do in the interim. So we obviously have section five as a tool to the extent privacy practices are unfair or deceptive, we can address them through Section 5. We also uh, have jurisdiction under a number of other laws like COPPA for children's privacy. And finally, we have a body of consents that provide very good rules of the road taken together. Uh, Professor Solov has called those essentially the common law of privacy in the United States. And so we can continue to apply all of the existing precedent that we have. Some people have talked about creating a Bureau of Privacy at the Federal Trade Commission, and I would welcome that if we have federal privacy legislation that provides the guardrails for what our jurisdiction is and how the law is to be enforced. With respect to a law itself, I do think, again, it's appropriate for Congress to make the value judgments. I, I do believe it would be appropriate, though, for Congress to delegate to the FTC certain rulemaking authority on narrow, discrete issues, as it has done with COPPA. And so I hope that we see federal privacy legislation, and, uh, and I will do whatever I can to help get that across the finish line. Thank you. I share your hope. Um, and let's see if the, this is finally the year. But um, so um, turning back to Commissioner Phillips, um, Chairman Khan has made clear her interest in using FTC unfair methods of competition rulemaking to address a variety of topics, um, including possibly online advertising. And uh, Commissioner Phillips, I've heard you express doubts about the FTC's authority for UMC rulemaking. Uh, and I uh, was hoping you'd share your thoughts with the audience. Sure. The simple, you know, few word version of is it's illegal and unconstitutional. So why is it illegal and unconstitutional? So let me start with the illegality of the thing. There is a claim 
that FTC Eager Beaver lawyers in the 1960s concocted that our statute from 1914, 1915, depending on how you date it, um, gave us broad regulatory power across the economy with the exception of, I guess, common carriage uh, and nonprofits. I don't think that's right. Um, they were very smart lawyers, and they managed to persuade uh, the DC Circuit in the early 1970s that this was so. But to read that opinion, which is called National Petroleum Refiners Today, um, where the judges said, hey, we're not sure. We've looked at the legislative history. It's not clear. But we have a strong presumption in favor of regulatory power for agencies because that's more efficient and effective for them to help get their job done. That opinion looks so different from the major questions doctrine today. If you think about what the Supreme Court wrote with respect to the vaccine mandate or with respect to the eviction ban, the courts are very clear that where Congress wants to vest agencies with broad regulatory authority, it has to be clear about it. And I think it's fairly clear from the DC Circuit's opinion in the early 1970s, Congress was anything but clear. So that's point number one. Um, it's important to understand, and we need look no further than the President's executive order on competition, all of the different ideas that folks think they can pour into the vessel of competition rulemaking. Why? Because the competition rulemaking is based on three words itself, unfair methods of competition. And the FTC, um, as you know, withdrew a policy statement um, putting some very, very basic limits on what they might mean. A policy statement you opposed because it was too vague. Exactly, yes. Um, and as soon as the Democrats had a majority, they, they pulled down that policy statement. So they recognize no limit to what their authority is. The president thinks it applies to labor and pharmaceuticals and devices and commercial surveillance, whatever that means, on and on and on. Um, these words are interesting. Right? Why, are, why are unfair methods of competition interesting? Because they sound a heck of a lot like the National Industrial Recovery Act from the New Deal, um, which in the Schechter Poultry case, the Supreme Court said constituted an unconstitutional delegation of authority from Congress to an administrative agency. It was so broad, it was so much power, and it was so ill-defined by Congress that Congress was literally taking its legislative power vested in it right under Article I in the Constitution and just giving it to an agency. That was the National Industrial Recovery Act. C Codes of fair competition was the wording. Our statute says unfair methods of competition. And the court was aware of this. But of course, the, but of course the court in the 1930s had absolutely no idea that in the 1960s, FTC lawyers would discover regulatory authority. We didn't have the authority then. I don't think we have it now. Um, so I think not only is this um, a claim of power, an assertion of authority that as a matter of statutory interpretation, courts are highly unlikely to credit. I think it is such a broad grant, if it does exist, that it would be considered unconstitutional. I will also add a plug for a blog post that I did today on truth on the market, arguing the following. One of the interesting trends here um, of sort of asserting a lot of rules is that there's a strong suggestion that the rules will be per se rules, right? And one of the complaints um, of antitrust reformers is what I point out in my blog post, which is that over the years, the courts have moved away from per se rules. The courts have been telling us again and again and again, we want you to take a look at the conduct in the context and understand the costs and benefits. Um, not just say, that sort of looks bad and we condemn all things that look like that. And so you have, on a substantive level, in a certain sense, um, a claim that we have this power to make these rules um, but courts saying that the underlying substance of antitrust law uh, is much more a rule of reason, to go back to Justice Brandeis uh, in Chicago Board of Trade, than it is a series of per se rules. So I think there's a, depending on what they do, in addition to the statutory problem, in addition to the constitutional problem, I think there may be a substantive problem, uh, a tension with antitrust law itself. It's going to be you know, quite, the, um, quite the feast, I think, for constitutional lawyers and administrative law lawyers, uh, if 
the FTC moves forward in this area, in addition to the antitrust lawyers and the consumer protection lawyers who are already paying attention to these issues. So lots of fun ahead. Um, so I know we're running short on time, uh, but I do have one more question uh, for Commissioner Wilson. Um, so there, it's no secret that there are currently sharp disagreements at the FTC and a breakdown of its traditionally bipartisan approach, uh, which had been a hallmark of the commission during Democratic and Republican administrations over the past 40 years or so. And I know that was certainly my experience uh, uh, when I was at the FTC. Uh, and even the FTC staff has expressed their concerns with their current leadership in the annual employee viewpoint survey that just came out. So Commissioner Wilson, you recently gave a speech explaining your view that this isn't merely a difference in style, but rather reflects a more fundamental difference in philosophy, uh, which I really appreciated your speech. It was incredibly thoroughly documented uh, and just found it fascinating uh, reading. Uh, and I would recommend it to everyone. Um, but would you be willing to provide us some highlights from that? Sure, absolutely. So uh, first of all, I'd like to start out by saying that the FTC community, including commissioners, including staff, has always been a very collegial and bipartisan place to work. It's what makes the FTC community uh, such, a, such a special place to, uh, to work. And, and working at the FTC has provided me with my two best uh, most fulfilling opportunities in my entire career. Uh, as chief of staff to, to Chairman Miris, and now as a commissioner, I was also here uh, when I was a law clerk in law school. And so I have seen the commission from several different levels and perspectives. I've also worked across the table from uh, the FTC when I was in private practice. And we have an incredible staff who works very hard, who cares deeply about protecting consumers, and who is very committed to the mission of the agency. And so you indicated the employee survey, the federal employee survey was issued recently. Those were uh, dismal results that I think arise from a disdain and marginalization of staff by current leadership. And I think that is one data point in part of a broader pattern. So to step back, uh, as everyone in the room knows, we have had a broad consensus on how to apply the antitrust laws for, for many decades. We look to maximize uh, consumer welfare. We look to, uh, to, to boost efficiency in the marketplace to ensure the efficient allocation of resources. <laughs> And we ground our, our analysis on economics, sound economics, economics that develops. Uh, and, and of course, the antitrust arena has evolved over time. It wasn't meant to be static. It isn't static, as we indicated in our answers regarding the RFI for the merger guidelines. Noah and I both said, you know, we, we want to see new learning incorporated. Um, and so it is a constantly evolving area of law, as it should be. But we started to see some very anomalous developments in recent years. First, we saw calls to substitute other goals for the consumer welfare standard. We saw the better deal from Senate Democrats. We saw a book by Tim Wu, who is now in the White House, who argued that antitrust has failed us all. Uh, we saw Commissioner Rohit Chopra arrive at the FTC and begin excoriating the agency and the commission and the staff is being lax and feckless for the last 40 years. And then we saw Chair Khan's arrival and a complete disregard for the rule of law and due process, not to mention complete disregard for staff and other developments that I talk about in the paper. And, and I must admit, I was a bit mystified. Some of these data points seem unrelated, but I started pulling some of my old political science books off the shelves. And I, I went back and I started reading Rousseau and Hegel and Kant and Marx. And then I started reading critical legal studies pieces. And I, I began to realize that maybe there are parallels among Marxism 
critical legal studies and the neo-Brandeisian worldviews. I am not trying to, uh, to be inflammatory. I am trying to approach this in a very scholarly way. I am looking at original texts and attempting to understand the parallels that I may be seeing. And so the speech, uh, which you note is, is incredibly well cited, is an attempt to do that. Uh, but let me just give you a couple of, of, of examples. So for example, Marx views the rule of law as a tool of the ruling class that sustains existing inequality. And critical legal studies takes a very similar perspective. Uh, and so do the neo-Brandesians. And here's the, here's the upshot of that. People who defend the status quo are not just wrong, they are also corrupt. And so you see in recent developments, members of the neo-Brandesian community labeling uh, the Federal Trade Commission, the antitrust community at large, and the FTC staff specifically, not just as lazy and incompetent, but also as corrupt, which is um, reprehensible. Due process uh, is, a, is a subset of, uh, of the rule of law and when you look at critical legal studies, you see this notion that due process is a speed bump on the road to justice. And we see the neo-Brandesian approach to governing the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, Commissioner Phillips and I tend to get very little notice about uh, items on which we are to vote. We have no transparency. We are unable to get information and documents from staff. and. Uh, the normal due process that is afforded to other stakeholders similarly has been denied. And this, uh, the notion is due process is, um, isn't really important and is just a tool used to implement the rule of law, which is a tool used to sustain existing inequalities, um, I think may explain some of the behavior that we're seeing in terms of the governing of the FTC right now. Uh, with respect to capitalism, what we see is benefits of competition, lower prices, greater productivity are actually drawbacks for Marx and for the neo-Brandesians. If you think about the labor theory of value, which says that an item is valuable only to the extent that labor has been poured into it, then a decreased price is, uh, is in fact uh, theft by capitalists, uh, and, and so is increased productivity because labor is not reaping fully the rewards. And so if you, if you read what Marx and Trotsky have said about capitalism and competition as the engine and why necessarily capitalism will fail, it is because there is a uh, theft uh, by the capitalists of the workers, and ultimately they will revolt. And we see similarities in terms of the neo-Brandesian uh, disdain for low prices and for efficiencies, as we talked about in, uh, in response to the merger guidelines question. With respect to consumers, we hold consumers to be the touchstone of antitrust enforcement, but we see, in fact, um, Labor has, has now been substituted. Chair Khan talks about the mission of the agency as protecting workers and honest businesses. Consumers take a back seat. And, uh, and that is very much in keeping with the approach of Marx and critical legal studies with respect to consumerism and private property and commoditization and the cheapening of goods, which all uh, is in tension with the labor theory of value. And then uh, one final example, if you go back and look at Rousseau and Hegel, they view, uh, they view destruction as good. They view society as moving through different phases and the state is moving through different phases and every subsequent phase will be superior to the one that we just passed through. And so destruction, war, tumult are actually good because they will lead to progress. And maybe the reason that Rohit Chopra was so uh, viciously um, critical of the Federal Trade Commission and staff, and maybe the reason that Chair Khan has been so disdainful of staff 
uh, resulting, of course, in absolutely terrible employee survey results, is because they don't care if the Federal Trade Commission gets trashed because they believe that progress is right around the corner. And it pains my heart. Let me just close by saying I love the Federal Trade Commission community. I think it is a community of people who want to do right by American consumers. And I just find it reprehensible when the neo-Brandesians and their allies attack, in particular, our staff as lazy and corrupt because th there is not a harder working group of people in the federal government. Uh, th thank you, Commissioner uh, Wilson, for those very heartfelt remarks. I know we could, there's so many interesting topics and we could go on all day, but I know I need to turn it back to Randy at this point uh, okay. uh, to well, close us of, out. First of all, uh, thank you, Maureen, and thanks to the commissioners. Don't anyone go anywhere for just a couple more minutes uh, before we have a chance to say goodbye, uh, because uh, I, I mentioned earlier uh, that we have a tradition here at the Free State Foundation of trying with all of our sessions, if possible, to have a couple of questions uh, that's been important to me over the years. So we're going to we're going to try and do that. So uh, those of you in the audience, uh, uh, you can formulate a question in your mind if you might have one. I'm going to use uh, my privilege uh, uh, as the one that pays for this event, maybe to ask <laughs> the first, first couple of, uh, just two questions, really. Uh, number one, let me say this first. I've read the article, uh, the Neo Brandesian article myself, and I just want to second what uh, Maureen said. It's a terrific scholarly article, whether you agree with all of it or some of it or not, you'll learn a lot by reading it. And uh, I commend you for that, uh, Commissioner Wilson. In fact, when I was reading it, I thought, this is a future think tanker for sure, uh, <laughs> someone that wrote an article like that, maybe even at the Free State Foundation, uh, <laughs> but another day. So t really, two things. I want one of you to explain to the audience, just to make sure we make a connection. You know, the, you kept referring in your article his style, uh, the neo-Brandesians, along with the others. Explain, really, for someone that might not know what the connection is, I assume you're referring, I think, to Louis Brandeis. And if that's right, what, what, what does that term implied to you. And then secondly, I want to ask Commissioner Wilson, because this is important to me, this topic of, of the non-delegation doctrine, the constitutional issues for agencies. Uh, a lot of that's coming to the fore now with the, the major questions doctrine receiving more prominence, and I appreciated your exposition. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, do you agree with what uh, Commissioner Phillips said uh, regarding the, the questionable constitutionality of the, uh, the unfair methods competition rulemaking issue. And then also one of you explain uh, to make sure we're all on the same page uh, what you're referring to when you say neo-Brandesians. Uh, you can answer the question about UMC first. Sure. So, so I will. I will just say that I agree with everything that Noah said about the legality and the constitutionality of UMC rulemaking. I also question its wisdom when you look at the failure of heavy-handed regulatory regimes in the United States. Uh, we have a lot to learn from those lessons. We see that heavy-handed regulatory re regimes. Uh, cause increases in price, they cause decreases in output, uh, they prefer rivals over competition and consumers, and they stifle innovation. And so for that reason, and also the reasons that Noah articulated, uh, I think that UMC rulemaking is not a road uh, that, that we should travel. And Noah, since you're in the room, I'll, I'll let you handle the Neo-Brandesian question. Sure. Um, let me just begin by echoing the last thing Christine said, which is a point that uh, needs to get made with respect to rulemaking. I also think it's a very bad idea, right? This vision that 
if we can just regulate more and more and more, we'll have better and better and better, is not borne out by history. And the way folks talk about rulemaking, there's no indication to suggest that that would be the result uh, in particular here. So with respect, Randy, to your question about what does neo-Brandeisian mean, it, it is obviously a reference to, uh, to Louis Brandeis, uh, who among other things was uh, as an advisor to President Wilson, instrumental in setting up the FTC, but it is a, um, it, it is a, a title, a, a label that a group of people um, who uh, have been, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, leaders in advocating for dramatic antitrust reform and the imposition of a lot of new regulation uh, in the economy uh, have adopted for themselves. Uh, I th I, it would be hard to describe that group without including Chair Khan among them. Uh, the group is broader and includes Tim Wu at the White House. I think uh, Barry Lynn is sort of the, the apex of this who runs the Open Markets Institute. Um, there are a number of others, but I think that's the group. Um, Josh Wright had a different term, uh, but I, 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 they have used the wording neo-Brandeis, and right. I, I always like to give people you know, the names that they choose for themselves. So I think right. they are trying to evoke Justice Brandeis. Uh, I think in the sense of looking at large private institutions, large companies as bad, and preferring um, more distributed power, they are like Brandeis. I think uh, to listen to some of the policy proposals and some of the language, and then to read Justice Brandeis's jurisprudence when he was actually in a position and an effect of making antitrust law, I think there's some real distinctions between the two. Great, well, you know, that's helpful to me and maybe others uh, as well, because the term is used so much now uh, in, you know, the community that, that you're in and that we're talking about it, you know, if someone Ra says, raise your hand if you're a neo Brandesian. You know, they may want to know what they're what they're buying into or not. So that's that's good. Uh, okay, uh, if anyone in the audience has a question, I'm uh, willing to entertain it. I'll say what I said before. You already asked one. I'm going to see what anyone asked, else does first. Uh, I, and uh, you know, questions are better than uh, statements, really. Okay, back in the back. And please identify yourself if yeah. you would. Uh, Joseph Sondry, uh, uh, NSMA. Um, high level, given well over 100 years ago, there was addictive properties in our food and cocaine and Coca-Cola. And now fast forward to today, we, we know that mobile phones, mobile phone apps are uh, the creators hire neuropsychologists to make them more sticky, more addictive. Um, what are the odds that there'll be any labels around that or removal of those addictive qualities, and how would that look? Happy to field that. I think it's really hard to assess odds um, and where the provenance of such a rule would, or such you know, a regulatory scheme would be. I'll say the following with respect to privacy. My sense, consistent, I think, with Commissioner Wilson and a lot of other people, has always been that one of the issues that we're tackling when we deal with privacy um, or other uses potentially of consumer data is an information asymmetry, right? Um, consumers may not understand fully what they're engaging in. And one of the things I've always felt would be very useful um, is to look more carefully at things like labels and understand you know, what are ways that we can get good information out to people. Um, we do this in a lot of other areas, right? And you think about food, right? It's maybe not efficient for me every day to, uh, you know, if I'm at the grocery store, examine each label. But if I care, and if I want to, and the cost to you, the producer of Honey Nut Cheerios, is fairly low, um, that can be a really beneficial rule, a rule that is good for competition, a rule that allows consumers to shop across products, including for those features. So let's take what are you doing with your data, right? And Apple has a version of this in iOS 14. They have these nutrition labels, they call them. But it's a way of taking complex subject matter and boiling it down um, in, terms of, in terms that allow people to sort of shop across products and compare, and perhaps even to create markets around features where markets may not naturally arise. 
Um, the question of you know, what constitutes addiction, what products you know, should properly be regulated like we regulate cocaine. Um, you know, I remember when I was growing up and my father was like, don't watch TV, it's addictive. Don't play Nintendo, it's addictive. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah go away. I don't care about sleep, I don't care about food. I wanna play Nintendo. Um, at what point we label it that, uh, and then seek, you know, in turn to apply labels, I think we can leave for another day. But there's definitely, right, a lot of people increasingly focused on, you know, why, pe why people are so attached to this, that, or the other product. Okay, uh, we have time really for one more question. Uh, I'm, you haven't asked a question, have you? All right. Go ahead, this has to be the last one, and we'll continue the discussion when we close up. I have a contract that uh, relates to the two o'clock hour here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, go ask your question, and, uh, and then no one leave until I say goodbye. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, my name is Dave Perr. I'm a reporter from Amlex. I'm just wondering, uh, Commissioner Wilson, should the Senate or the House convene a special committee to investigate potentially un-American activities that you've identified at the FTC and the White House. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, do you, uh, did you hear, the, I, you, you were a little bit because of your mask. Could you, you, did you want to respond to no, this I, question? I, I, no, I, I, yes, I, I heard the question. Thank you. Here's what I will say. I am attempting to understand the data points that I am seeing. And uh, when Chair Khan says that all decisions are political, it seems appropriate to me to understand everything that she's written and what her politics are because she herself has said all decisions are political. But I'm trying to approach this in a scholarly way. I was uh, a political science major in undergrad, and so I'm pulling tomes of philosophy and history off the shelves and attempting to orient myself to the trends that I'm seeing around me. Okay, uh, I notice uh, Christine has not yet said that when she uh, leaves the Free State Foundation, I'm sorry, leaves the Federal Trade Commission, uh, that she wants to join the Free State Foundation, but uh, Randy, it's we, a very tempting offer. We do uh, appreciate <laughs> your uh, scholarship and, and your participation. And before we uh, give a round of applause to this group, I want to end really uh, by going back to something I said at the very beginning this morning, and that is that when we have these events and in our work at the Free State Foundation, we definitely have our own set of principles and preferences and predispositions, but we value having uh, uh, others' opinions represented and heard when we're having this, uh, these types of discussions. But here's one thing I'm gonna say on which I don't want any difference of opinion expressed, no diversity of opinion. That over, I think you'll agree that over the last four and a half hours uh, that we've been here, uh, there hasn't been any other place in Washington in the last week or so where there's been such a stimulating discussion among so many great speakers about so many important issues. So uh, I believe that is true. I wanna thank all of the people that uh, spoke earlier, of course, and now I'd like for you to join me uh, in thanking uh, Maureen for moderating this panel, Maureen Ohausen, uh, Commissioner Noah Phillips for being here, and of course, uh, Christine Wilson as, as well. So with that, we're gonna say thank you and thank them, and then I'm gonna declare uh, this conference adjourned until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye and thanks.